This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar entitled, What's on the Horizon in PNH? The Latest on Emerging Treatments. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onofre, Director of Patient Education at AMDSIS, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to thank Alexion and Achillian for providing educational grants and the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers for providing support for this webinar program. Today's presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Griffiths. Dr. Griffiths joined the Roswell Parks Leukemia Service in the Department of Medicine in March 2010. Dr. Griffiths treats patients with blood disorders, specifically acute myeloid and lymphoid lymphomas, as well as bone marrow failure syndromes such as aplastic anemia, MDS, and PNH. The program in myelodysplasia at RPCI is recognized by the MDS Foundation as an MDS Center of Excellence. She is a clinical assistant professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo and is a faculty member of the Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, I'm sorry, in Buffalo Graduate Training Programs in the Departments of Pharmacology and Therapeutics as well as Immunology. Dr. Griffiths is board certified in hematology, oncology, and internal medicine and is licensed in both New York and Maryland. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Griffiths. Well, hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. I think most of you know what that is and um, what's coming on the horizon and where we stand. Um, in order to discuss this topic, we're first going to introduce the subject of what is PNH, what's the diagnosis, how do you make the diagnosis. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what current therapy is for this diagnosis and what new therapies are coming and why they're needed. And then we'll discuss briefly uh, how to access effectively clinical trials and how to look for trials that might be open in your area. So PNH was, has fascinated hematologists for a really long time, largely because it presents with a very unique clinical symptom. Um, this was a, a case of intermittent hematinuria, uh, initially presented by William Gull, in which he described a 33-year-old leather worker who was working um, in very cold circumstances during the winter, and he described this change in his urine color, uh, where the urine went from amber, which is what we would normally think of as normal, to red, mahogany, dark indigo, and indigo. And this was particularly notable for him in the cold months, where he was getting continuously wetted down while uh, processing um, hides um, and washing them in the cold. And so this, this process has fascinated hematologists because of its unique clinical presentation. So what is PNH? PNH is a disorder of blood that affects actually all the different cell types that come from the bone marrow. The disease is pretty rare. There are only about one and a half cases per million of population. It seems to occur more frequently in Asian countries in association with aplastic anemia. It can present relatively early or late in life, but tends to spare children and occur in the, with more, most frequency in the mid-teens. And manifestations can be uh, classical in terms of presentation or more obscure. The disease occurs as a result of a mutation in a gene in a blood stem cell. Um, the gene that is most commonly affected is, is called PIG A, or phosphatidylinositol glycan A, and it's located on the X chromosome. And that means that um, only an activation of only one gene can result in the disease phenotype. In most cases of PNH, the change in the gene is an acquired event. So you don't pass this on from mother to father, or from mother to children, or from father to son. It's not something you're born with. Um, when these mutations arise and why is not entirely recognized, but we know that even normal people can acquire these mutational events in their, in their genes, and it's only under specific circumstances that they can expand and become a, a dominant population. The gene product contains genetic information for something called a GPI anchor, which link a whole bunch of proteins to, to cell membranes. So a mutation is a mistake or a change in the gene message or the gene instructions that arises during the copying process and isn't corrected appropriately. If you develop a mistake 
when your when your stem cell divides, the mutation can then be transmitted to the daughter cells within within the bone marrow. And the effect of a mutation can be nothing. So you can have a mutation that doesn't actually change change the result of of the of the product. You can alter the protein, such as when you see that you, such as we see in patients with who have sickle cell disease and a sickle which results in a sickle hemoglobin or a change in shape in the presence of oxygen. And um, it can be that no protein at all is produced, as in, he as in PNH or patients with hemophilia. This cartoon here from a recent review article published by Anita Hill and colleagues um, document do demonstrates what can happen. So our hematopoietic stem cells are born with us and live with us our whole life. These hematopoietic stem cells, in the course of your, your life, um, divide relatively infrequently, less than once a month. And when they divide, one of those stem cells stays in the bone marrow, and the other grows up. And under normal circumstances, that cell grows up and becomes a multipotent progenitor, which can give rise to all the different types of cells we have in our body, and then becomes a committed progenitor, which gives rise to things like B and T cells, which direct the immune system, um, monocytes, which clean up masses, uh, granulocytes, which are the infection-fighting foot soldiers of our immune system, dendritic cells, which educate T and B cells into recognizing uh, antigens in terms of virus and, and other, other proteins, and basophils or other sub -cell, sub subtypes of cells, um, which are important um, special forces of the immune system. They could also grow up to become erythrocytes or red blood cells, platelets, or macrophages, which go around and, and eat up any dead cells in your body. In PNH, one stem cell will develop a mistake, and that stem cell can become uh, a dominant population or the most frequent population giving rise to adult cells. And in PNH, this mistake can become the dominant population, and as a result of this mistake, red cells are subject to abnormal killing by a portion of the immune system called complement. So, in fact, many people can actually develop uh, very small numbers of mistakes in the pig A gene, and under the under normal circumstances, these these gene these mistakes have no survival advantage, and they can they can be present and then go away. It's usually a very small percentage of the total population. But in PNH, these abnormal cells have an advantage and they become ma a major portion of the producer of red cells, white cells, and platelets in the peripheral blood. can be as low as 1% or over 90% of the total product of the bone marrow. And this results in change in the immune system and, um, or it can be result, it can be result of a change in the immune system or it could be re related to an attack on the bone marrow as happens in aplastic anemia, uh, where the T cells in the body start to recognize um, proteins on the surface of, of um, stem cells, and those cells that express less protein, like the PNH cells, have a relative survival advantage and are selected for. So this cartoon, again from the same review that I mentioned before, demonstrates the multi-step process that normally results in the, the development of GPI-linked proteins that then get presented on the cell surface. And you can see this is a process that actually takes many, many different steps, up to 11 steps. And under normal circumstances, there are more than 100 different things that are held on the cell surface um, and are used by the body to identify the types of cells that you have and to protect those cells from the immune system as like a special handshake that your immune system has with your own cells to say, don't worry about us, we're okay. In PNH cells, an early mistake in this process results in a complete absence of more than 100 different types of protein on the cell surface. And this, this results in the clinical phenotype in PNH. So among the most important of these GPI-linked proteins are the, the genes CD55. That's the red and orange portions here on the cell surface. The GPI anchor is actually this, this maroon-colored piece here. And so when we have a missing, when this maroon-colored piece is missing, we lack all these different cell proteins on the surface. The ones that we care about, CD55, CD59, TFPI, other things, um, all result from this absence of this HSC-linked, uh, hematopoietic stem cell-linked uh, pig A gene. Some patients with PNH will have an aplastic anemia or a history of aplastic anemia or a bone marrow failure state like myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, many PNH patients will have evidence of a bone marrow that doesn't work quite well, so slightly low hemoglobin or slightly low platelet count. 
And we know that these two events interact, and they both they're 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 not the same event, but they are interrelated. Um, and we think that this allows emergence of the PNH cells. So PNH would not be a problem except that we have this very ancient portion of the immune system called complement. Complement is uh, is made up of many different blood proteins that all act together, and they're designed to protect you from invasion by, micro, by, by microbes, particularly by things that have a, a surface um, that's got sugar. So important microbes that are sugar-coated include things like pneumococcus, meningococcus, and uh, haemophilus influenza. And um, these are relatively difficult to kill because they have kind of a candy coating. You can think of them as being like M&Ms. And so in order to kill them off, the immune system recognizes them and punches a hole in their candy coating so as to allow water to rush in and kill those things. Um, and these cells are recognized because they don't have inhibitory proteins on the cell surface. And those inhibitory proteins, CD55 and CD59, for example, are, are missing on the red cell. And so the immune system, the complement system, sees you the red cells and some of the other cells in the body as being like those encapsulated bacteria, and so seeks to kill them. Um, usually, complement circulates in an active form and gets activated all the time by relatively low-level things. It gets activated more at night to protect you, and it gets activated anytime you have an infection or anytime you get a traumatic event. So if you get scared or if you get stressed, um, vaccinations can activate it. A surgical procedure, which is a big stress, can activate it. Um, autoimmune disease can activate it, pregnancy can activate it. All of these things can upregulate the function of the complement system and can increase the risk um, of causing hemolysis to any unprotected cells. Under normal circumstances, as I said, this complement activity is regulated on your own cells by proteins in the blood and also on the membranes of the cells. And a lot of these are GPI linked. Again, the most important of these are the 59 and 55 I mentioned, which are missing in cells from, from clones that are, that are PNH, that are, that are PNH clones. And for this reason, particularly red cells are extremely sensitive to even very small amounts of activated complement. So this is a picture, a very relatively simplistic cartoon of the complement cascade. Activation of this cascade can happen through something called the lectin pathway, through the classical pathway, or through the alternative pathway. And they, these things activate a protein called C3 in the blood, which gets cleaved into C3A and C3B. And C3B then becomes the C5 convertase in association with something called BB. And C5 that again gets broken up into C5A and C5B. C5A is pro-inflammatory, activates white cells. And under normal circumstances, this can be a good thing to protect you from infections. And then C5B uh, becomes the membrane attack complex and actually punches those holes we talked about. So this is a cartoon to see what happens. You get C5, which gets activated into C5A and C5B. C5B sits down on the cell surface, pulls in C6, C7, um, and then pulls in C8, which makes a little punch in the hole in the membrane. In red cells under normal circumstances, CD59, which is linked by this GPI anchor, blocks this process. And C9 does not get activated into the cell membrane. But if we get rid of CD59, C9 then gets, con gets recruited, and it punches this little micelle, or it punches this little ho these holes. And these C5, C9 molecules like one another, and they form a hydrophilic pore. And so they stick together. And they make this little circle like this, nine molecules of C C9. And this pore allows water to pass through. And when this happens, you can see here a picture of a red blood cell membrane where you have multiple little holes, and these holes allow water to pass. Under normal circumstances, the inside of your cells is relatively packed with stuff, and the outside of your cells is relatively, relatively water. There's more water on the outside than the inside. If you make a hole, by osmotic pressure, water rushes in to dilute the stuff on the inside of cells and it, it breaks open all of those cells. And so you end up with red cells that are, that are broken open. And these are two pictures from Wendell Ross, one of the fathers of PNH uh, work, um, who's now retired. So the complement attacks the red cells. They break up, causing intravascular hemolysis. That's inside your blood vessels, the red cells break open, releasing free hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is a great thing. It carries oxygen. 
but it's a really tiny molecule. And if it's not contained inside of a red blood cell bag, that molecule can bind other things, not just oxygen. The, the breakup of the red cells causes anemia or low hemoglobin. The pieces of those membrane are released into circulation. Those pieces of membrane activate clotting. White cells can also be attacked in this way, and platelets can be attacked too, and all of these can directly activate clotting. And these, the, the free hemoglobin can also scavenge something called nitric oxide, which is an important oxygen-related molecule. It's one molecule of nitrogen and one molecule of oxygen. And that, that combination of that, that nitric oxide, under normal circumstances, allows your, your muscle, smooth muscle in the body to relax in order to open the esophagus, to open blood vessels, to allow good blood flow. If you scavenge that nitric oxide, then the esophagus can spasm, uh, the GI tract can spasm, and you can have um, increased vascular reactivity and high blood pressure and high pressure in the, in the lungs as well. So some of that free hemoglobin can actually pass through the kidneys and into the urine directly. That's actually what causes the red urine in patients with PNH. This hemoglobin contains iron and so can cause iron deficiency in patients with, with PNH that goes on for a long time. And the iron um, and the, the hemoglobin gets absorbed back by the kidneys, and that iron can actually break oxygen into free radicals and actually cause peroxidation in the kidney, which can damage the kidney. The free hemoglobin also, as I said, binds the nitric oxide, which causes vascular and smooth muscle spasms and can cause overall inflammation in the body. So in summary, in PNH cells, we have a deficiency of, uh, of GPI anchors that result from some kind of an attack on the bone marrow. And these GPI anchor deficient cells have a relative survival benefit. Um, in PNH patients, the reactive T cells kill off some of the normal stem cells, leaving behind these PNH deficient, these PNH cells, and they become a dominant population. And this dominant population gives rise to cells in the peripheral blood that are then subject to killing by the older portion of the immune system called the complement system. Bone marrow failure is a frequent um, coexisting event in patients with PNH. 10 to 40 percent of aplastic anemia patients will have a PNH clone, and in fact, the presence of a PNH clone predicts a good response to immunosuppression or immunosuppressive therapy. And that sort of tells you the story that these are two interrelated things. Some people with unexplained bone marrow failure, diseases where you have low blood counts but they're not meeting the criteria for aplastic anemia, will also have PNH clones. And a percentage of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome will have a PNH clone. And these patients are often more likely to respond to immunosuppression, as I said before. So the effects of this process usually cause anemia. So most patients with PNH will have low hemoglobin. Many of these patients will have stressed bone marrow, so they'll have a reticulocytosis, or young red cells that we can see in the peripheral blood. They'll have low nitric oxide levels in the blood, and this nitric oxide depletion can cause um, pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the lungs. It can cause hypertension. It can cause belly pain. It can cause esophageal spasm. And it can cause hemolysis in other parts of the system. Um, Thrombosis is, a, is another problem that we see a lot in patients with PNH, so not just anemia, but also blood clots. Almost half of PNH patients will have a clotting event. Um, most of these are DVTs or PEs, so deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. Um, but some of them can also be, um, uh, can also be um, cerebrovascular accidents, strokes, or heart attacks. Um, a percentage of patients will have an unusual blood clot, such as those seen in the, in the portal or the liver circulation. And these can actually be pretty substantial and can be a presenting feature of the disease. Um, these can be actually very, very potentially life-threatening. So important to recognize um, thrombosis and the, the patients who develop thrombosis who have, who have a coexisting PNH because the anticoagulation approach is not as effective in these patients. So people with PNH clones don't necessarily need to be treated. As I said before, patients, some patients with aplastic anemia can have a very small clone, less than 5%, less than 1% even, 
And in those patients, the presence of a clone of PNH cells predicts a good response to immunosuppressive therapy, and that's usually the treatment we recommend. If, they, if the person has a low, has a profound aplastic anemia with a low platelet count or a low white cell count and a low cellular marrow. Um, patients who have, by contrast, clear evidence of intravascular hemolysis with a very high LDH, and LDH can be a surrogate marker for depletion of nitric oxide, or people who have a high LDH in association with symptoms that suggest nitric oxide scavenging, like belly pain or evidence of high blood pressure in the lungs, pulmonary hypertension, people who have kidney problems associated with this, and fatigue is a frequent symptom in these patients as a result of the intravascular hemolysis. So symptoms in association with clear evidence of intravascular hemolysis with an elevated LDH, these are things that would push you to consider some form of treatment directed at the PNH and not necessarily directed at the, at the aplastic anemia. So in my practice, the people I screen for PNH would be people who have an unexplained intravascular hemolysis, which is present in, in a majority of patients with, with PNH. Usually these people have an elevated serum LDH, but, have a Coom, but are Coombs negative, and Coombs testing is the presence of antibodies on the surface of red cells. Um, a small percentage, about a third of people, will have evidence of hemoglobin in the urine. And some people will have been told that they have red blood cells in the urine, but when you look under the microscope, in fact, there are no red cells. It's all just free hemoglobin. Patients who have an unusual blood clot, so a Bud Chiari or a portal or a mesenteric blood clot or a, an unusual uh, skin vein blood clot, somebody who is relatively young who has an arterial clot without an explanation, or people who have an elevated LDH in association with evidence of bone marrow failure, bone marrow dysfunction, such as aplastic anemia or a myelodysplastic syndrome, and people who have symptoms uh, in, in association with the evidence of chronic hemolysis or an elevated LDH, um, suggestive of nitric oxide depletion. So eculizumab was approved by the FDA in 2007 and has been used by a lot of people with PNH. And this is a monoclonal antibody, um, which, is a, um, a, which is given as an intravenous infusion. And it binds to that complement protein called C5 that I mentioned before. And it blocks terminal activation of the complement system and prevents uh, the complement system from punching holes in red cell membranes and in all, indeed in membranes of, um, of invading bacteria as well. And this drug was first demonstrated um, in, in phase one clinical trials and then in a phase two and phase three clinical trials when it was given intravenously on a schedule weekly initially and then every two weeks. LDH, which I said again was a, is, a, is a marker for nitric oxide levels in blood, drop precipitously. And this is, this is a combination of the three uh, seminal studies using this drug. And what you can see is in the, in the patients who got the drug in the phase one and two setting, immediately when the drug was started, the LDH fell precipitously. And that LDH was maintained in a relatively more normal range um, for the duration of the study. And then this group of patients listed in the blue here were maintained on placebo. They didn't get the active drug. But as soon as they were switched over to receive the active drug, you saw a precipitous drop off in the LDH. And this was associated with an improvement in clinical symptoms. This is a picture of urine that was provided by Wendell Ross. Um, and this was a patient of his who was evaluating his urine based on appearance. And the patient showed this picture um, that this was the appearance of his urine regularly before he started his eculizumab treatment. And then immediately after starting eculizumab, he noticed that his urine was always straw colored, always more yellow, suggesting that um, the active intravascular hemolysis had been blocked. Quite a dramatic effect. And in fact, the improvement in clinical symptoms, so improvements in things like fatigue and belly pain and other symptoms of PNH, were markedly better on eculizumab even before the hemoglobin became normalized. So the hemoglobin stayed about the same, but symptoms fell off precipitously, um, suggesting that part of the, the benefit of this was actually blocking that intravascular hemolysis, which scavenging the nitric oxide. Maybe the nitric oxide normalization was, in fact, the mechanism by which people felt better. <laughs> 
So eculizumab has demonstrated a substantial change in the life expectancy for patients with PNH. Um, there has been demonstration of an improved overall survival. Indeed, uh, Dr. Saussier, who's the head of the, of the um, PNH group in France, recently published a review based on um, results from a cohort of more than 2,500 patients with PNH who are part of the PNH registry. And compared with retrospective um, outcomes for patients with PNH, the overall survival, particularly in the group of patients with uh, hemolytic PNH, uh, was substantially better than the historical controls. Um, there's substantial improvement in terms of nitric oxide depletion and normalization of LDH with related improvements in related pathologies like fatigue, hemolysis, maybe improvement in blood clots. In fact, some people are actually able to come off anticoagulation and improvement in the heart problems. And both an immediate improvement in kidney function as well as delayed long-term improvements in kidney function over the long-term exposure to the drug. So this, is, this has been a real game changer for many patients with, with active intravascular hemolytic PNH. By contrast, um, patients with aplastic anemia-associated PNH, where the clone is relatively smaller, have not done as well. And these patients are maybe patients where things like allogeneic transplant should be considered uh, more aggressively uh, because people are dying related to complications of the aplastic anemia. So this is a cartoon, again, from this review that I'm very fond of. Um, and what you can see here is under normal circumstances, red blood cells present CD55 and CD59. That blocks activation of complement on the red cell surface. And you get no evidence of intravascular hemolysis or, or breaking of those red cells. In PNH red cells, we get activation of complement. These cells get broken intravascularly, and you can get intravascular hemolysis. This can happen. Um, at low tick over, so once a patient has a, has a low, low clone of PNH, it can actually be relatively asymptomatic. Um, and so people can, um, people can be okay. Um, once we start, but, and then there are those people who are more symptomatic, and those are people who might get put on eculizumab. So once we start a patient with PNH on eculizumab, and we block activation of complement, we block the terminal activation of complement, so we block the membrane attack complement complex, so we don't get holes anymore, but the earlier portion of the complement cascade get, still gets activated, and that, that involves, as you may recall, the activation of C3 to, to, ISO, uh, to, uh, to C3B and C3A, and C3B gets deposited on the surface of the, these PNH red cells, and so this C3B actually activates macrophages and can actually result in some extravascular hemolysis in people getting eculizumab. And this can be more or less symptomatic and more or less problematic and can result in some continued need for red blood cell transfusions in patients on eculizumab. And so the problems that are currently um, an issue with eculizumab are that it, it needs to be given intravenously. Um, it's given on a weekly schedule for the first four weeks and then thereafter every two weeks IV, and you have to be kind of tied to the location where you're getting it. Um, some people have been successfully able to travel um, to other places in the world as long as we can identify a place for them to get intravenous eculizumab um, while they're on vacation, but it essentially means that you can't go very long or very often without setting up, um, se setting up um, you know, a place to get your eculizumab. The drug is extraordinarily expensive, and so many people, including me, have been very um, unhappy with the company that makes the drug because we think it's way too expensive. And so some people are left with a fairly substantial copay, although uh, Alexion has been pretty generous in providing some copays for some people, but not everyone. Um, access is a problem. The drug is not supported by all healthcare care uh, programs worldwide. And so there are, there are people across the world who have real PNH who cannot gain access to this drug as a result of a lack of availability in, in particular areas. Uh, this is particularly true in places in Africa. The frequency of dosing I mentioned before. And actually many people uh, report inadequate control of symptoms with breakthrough of fatigue and breakthrough of symptoms uh, near the end of the dosing interval or even, even a week in. And, and this can be a problem. It's largely related probably to the fact that when eculizumab was first developed, um, we didn't know how much was enough, and so um, the dosing is not weight-based, and so for larger people it might not be enough. Um, this is something that, that I think many of us have been aware of. And then people can have fatigue or failures of the drug, 
either in the, in the context of a complement activating condition, like a surgical procedure or an infection. Um, some people actually have genetic mutations that result in, in complete resistance to eculizumab. And as I mentioned before, one can get extravascular hemolysis despite eculizumab therapy um, as a result of deposition of C3 on the red cell surface. So eculizumab does not improve necessarily impaired bone marrow function. And so people who have profound aplastic anemia or who have substantial symptoms from aplastic anemia as a result of bone marrow failure with low white cell counts, low neutrophil counts, or low platelet counts um, might not benefit substantially from PNH, especially for, in these people who have aplastic anemia or myelodysplasia. And so in these people, again, treatments with immunosuppression, with ATG, other immunosuppressions, or bone marrow transplant might be a more effective strategy to fix the bone marrow failure problem. Um, this can be a real problem um, for people who, who have a large PNH clone but who, whose bone marrow production is ineffective. And I have a couple of patients who are, who are suffering from this. So eculizumab won't be effective if you don't have PNH, right? So if you don't have that diagnosis, it's not going to help you. Um, for people who have very small clones, um, less than 10%, um, many of these people will actually not benefit from the drug, and, and so I, I, I'm very careful about who I initiate eculizumab on. I have to prove that they have clinical symptoms related to the PNH. And again, as I mentioned, patients with severe bone marrow failure, aplastic anemia, or myelodysplasia who have a large PNH clone may not benefit. Um, again, we talked about complement activating conditions, surgeries, stresses, infections, pregnancy um, can be very substantial complement activating conditions and may need additional eculizumab. Unfortunately, some clinicians might hold monoclonal antibodies in the context of an infectious process, being afraid that it might make things worse, um, which is actually the, the exact opposite thing that you need to do. And things like extravascular hemolysis are not addressed by eculizumab. So there are a variety of new drugs. In fact, there are more than 12 new drugs that are being actively tested um, for treatment of, um, of PNH. Um, there are treatments for aplastic anemia that are separate. Um, the treatment for PNH can be complicated by thrombosis and iron overload, um, as well as the disease manifestation um, of, of, of aplastic anemia. So some patients, once you get started on eculizumab, who still need transfusions can become iron overloaded. And so in this case, the options are phlebotomy, but if you're anemic, that's no longer a pro that's not a possibility. Um, other patients can benefit from oral iron chelation, so it's important to check the ferritin to make sure that iron overload is not occurring, especially in people who are receiving a, a regular red cell transfusion. This or, oral iron chelators, there are a variety of them, and they have, they're actually quite safe and can be effective as long as the kidney function is good. Um, there are a variety of different tests that need to be done before iron chelation is begun, including an eye test, a hearing test, and a protein test for the urine. Uh, but once we have those baseline tests, um, oral iron chelators can be very effective. And then in terms of management of complications like blood clots, um, we have a variety of novel oral anticoagulants um, that can save a lot of people from treatment with warfarin or with heparin. Um, these are mostly equally effective, they're, they're relatively safe, and they're relatively convenient with minimal drug interactions. And so this has been a, a step forward for a lot of patients. So the, the new oral anticoagulants, they actually target two different proteins in the coagulation cascade. You can see here this is von Willebrand factor, VW, uh, factor 9A, factor 2, and activated factor 2, which is thrombin. This is prothrombin factor 2, and thrombin is factor 2A. So um, the direct oral anticoagulants, um, a variety of them target an, uh, factor 2A. Uh, the um, and then uh, the uh, relatives of um, anoxaparin, rivaroxaban, other things that fact the um, uh, fondaparinox, for example, those factor those recognize uh, activated factor 10 or factor 10A, and um, those are targeting anti 10A. Those are anti 10A uh, therapies. Those are often oral, and then the 2A is um, dibigatran, which targets anti 2A, which targets 2A. And these are used by a variety of different people, and um, they're nice because they're oral. They have a reliable bioavailability, so most people can receive a similar kind of dose. They have relatively few drug-drug interactions. You don't have to monitor them, unlike warfarin, where you have to check the INR on a regular basis. They work pretty quickly, so within 24 hours of getting the drug, they, they, they're working. Um, that's good, but it's also bad because they also have a relatively short half-life. Um, and so 
people have to remember to take them. Warfarin hangs around a little bit, so there's a little bit more wiggle room if you forget your, to take your medication like I might do. <laughs> um, I often forget to take it within a few hours. Um, then, then you can be unprotected during that period. These drugs are cleared mostly by the kidneys, um, and so it's important to have normal kidney function. And um, these are usually associated with a relatively lower bleeding risk, um, largely because they have a relatively um, predictable and reliable pharmacokinetics, so you don't get high levels or low levels depending on what you're eating. Um, they've been tested mostly for people with cardiac disease, like atrial fibrillation, so the big trials with more than 10,000 people, and most of these are older people, but they're probably equally effective to old, our old types of anticoagulants. Um, we know that warfarin or coumadin is hard to keep in the right range and varies depending largely on what you're eating. You can't eat salad when you're on warfarin, so this, is, this gives you a little bit more wiggle room. Um, they do not, they're not liver toxic, and they seem to be associated with less bleeding inside the brain, possibly more GI bleeding. But a lot of people are moving to using these direct oral anticoagulants instead of warfarin or, or um, anoxaparin. So, who should be switched if they're on a warfarin? I, I would argue if you're on warfarin, you like it, and you've been on it for a long time. I, I think warfarin is a great drug, and I have a few people who are on it. Um, it this, these drugs are a little bit more convenient because you don't need to have an INR checked, but I would argue if you're on warfarin, a stable dose, you're only getting your INR checked once a month, that's maybe more convenient than starting to take a new medication. Um, it's important to be compliant with these drugs. As I said, they're relatively short-acting, so missing one dose can result in, in an increased risk of thrombosis. Um, people who have difficult to control INR, either as a result of other medications that they're on, congestive heart failure with liver congestion, people who like to eat a broad range of foods and who can't manage their, to control their INR, these are people who should be maybe switched to an oral anticoagulant. Um, people who have really good kidney function and good liver function, I would be more inclined to, to switch them and people who are unlikely to need urgent reversal um, uh, because there are no currently used or, or proven reversal agent for, agents for these drugs. So what do we have in terms of clinical trials specifically for PNH? I think unmet needs are, are efficacy. I have a lot of patients who have breakthrough symptoms at the end of the dosing interval. Um, I think it's a pain to re require uh, to come into the infusion clinic every two weeks. Some people are getting, these, getting eculizumab or Solaris at home uh, through home care agencies, but again, this needs to be given intravenously, so there are some issues with that. Um, I think that having multiple players within this market will likely drive down cost, which I think will be beneficial for everyone. Um, the issues here are that we have a, a drug which we know can improve outcome for patients, and so when we have unproven drugs, we want to make sure that those drugs are at least as safe and at least as effective. And so. Um, those are, those are issues that come up when we think about clinical trials. Um, and we all have some suspicions about what's going to be really effective, but we have to do clinical trials to prove that um, so that we can know for sure. Um, this is a cartoon uh, documenting some areas where there's drugs under development. So Compstatin is an, is an inhibitor. Uh, Compstatin is an inhibitor of uh, C3 activation. There's actually a drug that's targeting the MAS P3 uh, activator of complement factor D. Uh, there's a drug directly inhibiting complement factor D activation called ACH4471. Um, there are a whole series of drugs uh, being developed to target C5 in different ways, which I'll cover in a moment. And there are a couple of other drugs here on the mark uh, being developed. Many of these are in a variety of different um, clinical trials. APL2 is also targeting C3. So here are the C5 inhibitors that you can find if you look on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, probably the most well-developed here is uh, Alexion 1210 product. The phase three clinical trial has completed accrual, and um, we're waiting on a readout from this study. Um, we participated in this clinical trial. Essentially, this drug um, is a reformulation of eculizumab, and the drug gets um, processed intracellularly and released back onto the cell surface. So eculizumab gets eaten by, um, by macrophages and then gets degraded. Um, Alexion 1210 gets eaten by the macrophage. Inside the macrophage, it actually gets, um, gets um, broken down from the, the binding uh, from, from C5 and then gets released back onto the cell surface. And so it prolongs the active period of the eculizumab product. Um, this is a phase three study. It's 
currently being it's relatively longer acting, given only every three months, two or three months. Um, there's some work to develop it as a sub Q formulation, although it's currently being given intravenously. Coversion as a subcutaneous is to being developed for subcutaneous uh, administration. It's an it's a small molecule inhibitor of C5. It's being developed for eculizumab failure that's currently in phase two testing. This RA101495 again is a subcutaneous monoclonal antibody. Uh, again, de developing for eculizumab failures. Um, these others are also um, monoclonals, um, again, being developed for uh, eculizumab failures. And um, this last one was actually uh, negative. The early phase, the phase one and two was negative in macular degeneration, so it's, it's not being developed as much. So this is, again, the complement cascade. You can see that there are a variety of different places we could intervene. Um, complement factor D is a relatively important portion of this, this cascade, and there's this molecule MASP3, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, inhibitors of a variety of these steps in the pathway, including C3 as well as C5, are in development, um, circled here. And the other, pathway, the other pathways that I mentioned before, these are the drugs that are currently being developed. There's this ACH0144471, which is an inhibitor of complement factor D. It's been identified by the European Union as a... As a as an orphan drug, and it's being, it's, what's unique about it is that it's an oral formulation. That's currently in phase two clinical trials in Europe. Uh, the drug APL2 um, is a drug that targets C3, uh, so it's earlier in the pathway. It's given subcutaneously. Um, this is being developed, uh, phase one and two studies have been quite active, and so there's currently a phase three clinical trial which has a, uh, an overlap portion, so people who are on eculizumab already um, we'll receive both drugs together, and then they will be switching over to the single drug. Um, early indicators uh, suggest this is quite an active drug. This is also being developed for macular degeneration. There's a drug called OMS906, which is an inhibitor of the MASP3. The MASP3. Um, this is currently in pre-phase one testing. And then there's a drug called TT30, which is being developed by Alexion, uh, which is, a, a, again, another inhibitor of C3. It's, again, going to be given IV, and it's in phase one testing. Um, so the TT30 actually binds to red cells and protects them from hemolysis. It's a small molecule here. It actually blocks the interaction of the, the breakdown of C3 into C3B. Um, it's thought to be maybe less, in, less causing less infection risk because in vitro, it looks like it doesn't block the ability of the complement cascade to attack um, meningococcus. There are some, clinical, there are some early uh, reports of this drug in blood and at the, uh, the ASH meeting from 2015. This ACH4471 is a small molecule, which is nice because it's oral. It, again, inhibits complement factor D, which is, uh, the, has the lowest drug levels in the, um, in the body of any, of any complement factor. It's the, the only human target of this is the, C, C, the complement factor B. Um, it should rock, block any residual red cell destruction that's currently going on in patients who receive eculizumab. It seems like in vitro it looks like it's synergistic with eculizumab and maybe could replace it. Um, there's, th there's obviously a big concern that blocking earlier in the complement pathway might um, increase the risk of infection. And then this drug I talked about, APL2, which is a small cyclic peptide. It's being given subcutaneously. It inhibits C3 conversion. Um, it's got a similar target re region to the, a the ACH4471 and should block the um, extravascular hemolysis that we see in patients who have extravascular hemolysis on eculizumab. Um, there's concern that it might increase the risk of infections, and so patients receiving this drug on clinical trial have to receive uh, an additional vaccination, so not just against meningococcus, they also are receiving uh, obligate, in, in, um, obligate vaccination against influenza and um, um, pneumococcus as well as haemophilus influenza. Um, the phase two data appeared to be quite positive, although they haven't been published formally. And uh, the phase three is currently, there are a couple of phase three clinical trials with this going on in PNH and in age-related macular degeneration. Uh, so this is the OMS 906. Um, this, again, is in preclinical development. It was originally thought to be part of the lectin pathway. It also activates comp this, this target, and mannose binding lectin-associated serine protease 3, uh, activates complement factor D. Um, we know that people who have a congenital deficiency of this protein actually have normal life expectancy with variable infection risk. 
And so this product is being developed by a company in Europe, um, and uh, trials are expected sometime in 2019. So the way to access clinical trials that might be relevant to you if you're interested is to check on the website clinicaltrials.gov. Um, clinicaltrials.gov, it's exactly like that if you put it into your web browser, and you can then search for studies, um, and this is available here, and then you should be able to pull up studies based on on the therapy that you use. Now, I can show you this, and it's relatively looks relatively simple, but it might be intimidating to use. And so, we have set up in this webinar webinar for me to be able to share my screen and for us to be able to search for some, for things. Um, so, I think you are going to help me to do that. Yep. So here, I'm going to share my screen with you. And oh, nope, that's the wrong page. <laughs> okay, here we have clinicaltrials.gov. And so um, when you're looking on the clinicaltrials.gov website, and I, I've provided the website there for you, HTTPS, www.clinicaltrials.gov, and you can look it up on Google and pull it up relatively easily. If you look for something you're interested in, say, let's say, say for example, PNH, and you search for it, um, you may find more than 70 different studies. Um, things that are, that are important to know about this website are that you want to look at uh, studies that are recruiting, <clears throat> and so if you click on recruiting, then you can apply this filter, and then you'll find 15 different studies, and so you can see here the different studies available. And if you click on the study that you're interested in, then you look down, it'll give you a little bit of an in, a piece of information about what the phase of the study is. Here you can see this is a phase two study, which expects to enroll between four and 12 patients. Um, and all the patients are going to get the drug. It's going to be given um, to look at change in baseline LDH. Um, in order to be eligible, you have to be older than age 18. Um, you have to include, you have to have uh, untreated PNH, and you have to have type 3 erythrocytes or a granule site clone greater than 10%. You can see here the requirements and the exclusion criteria. And then if you go down to the bottom, it'll give you the, the locations in which this study is being conducted. And you can see here this study is being conducted in Italy. Uh, and Korea, in New Zealand, and in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's being sponsored by Achillion Pharmaceuticals. So if we go back, you can see other studies, maybe something that's more active that's being done here in the United States. Let's look at this one. This is ACH144471. We talked about this before. Um, this is to look at, at the effectiveness of this drug in improving anemia, as measured by increases in blood hemoglobin when given in combination with eculizumab for 24 weeks in patients with established PNH. You can see here the different ex the experimental groups. Again, this is the oral inhibitor. Um, and this is going to be given together with eculizumab in group 1, in group 2, in group 3, and in group 4. You can see the different groups here, the primary outcome measures. And you can see the location of the different places that are actively recruiting to this study um, at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, where Donna Dore is the contact person and Rob Brodsky is the principal investigator, and Yarek Mashevsky, who many of you know also is at Cleveland Clinic, is not yet open. So this study is open at Hopkins and not yet recruiting at the Cleveland Clinic, although Dr. Mashevsky is likely to open it in the near future. So this is a small study and available for, you, for those who are interested. Um, you can go down and look back. Um, you can also look when you search um, for locations. You can look for age groups. So if you want studies for children or adults, um, you can also look at the study phase if you're only interested in particular types of studies. You can identify the funders for these studies. And usually there will be a contact information or a phone number uh, of a person you can reach out to directly. So with that, um, I can stop sharing this and disconnect from this. And we can go back to the main page. Okay, I pressed stop sharing. Okay, great. <laughs> That's me who didn't know how to use that, sorry. Um, and then we can go on to the next slide, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I see there are some that have shown up over here on the right, and I can address those. Sure. So thank you so much, Dr. Griffiths, for your very informative presentation. I think it was very helpful um, for us to be able to do a screen share and actually show our viewers how to navigate clinicaltrials.gov because it's very valuable um, information to know.
Um, our first question comes from Susan. Um, Susan is asking for your comment on the following. Um, I believe she uh, got this from an article, uh, from a Japanese PNH update article. Um, she quotes, new clinical complications such as resistance to ecolizumab, breakthrough hemolysis, extravascular hemolysis, and invasive meningococcal disease have emerged after the introduction of ecolizumab. Therefore, it is important to strategize effective ways to tackle these issues occurring during ecolizumab treatment. Sure. And so, would just like so, to know your comments. Yep. So, I think that the the comments that 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 quotation uh, highlights the things we talked about a little bit in in my in my presentation. Uh, historically, before the advent of eculizumab, uh, there really was no effective therapy for people with PNH, and and the historical survival rates were actually pretty poor. So I think it's great that we have a therapy for this rare disease that can actually make um, a majority of people who have hemolytic PNH uh, live a much more normal life expectancy. But the introduction of a drug that inhibits terminal complement um, comes with side effects, and that means that that results in an increased risk of infection, particularly encapsulated bacterial infections. And so, um, any patient who gets eculizumab should be receiving vaccination against meningococcus. And there are actually two recommended vaccine types for meningococcus. There's the multi, the polyvalent meningococcal vaccine, um, and then there's the B serogroup meningococcal vaccine. Both of those are approved in the United States. Um, there are two different uh, men B vaccines that are used. Um, both of them are reasonably effective, and they require um, pre free the, the men B vaccination uh, usually has to be boosted a bit more frequently. The multivalent meningococcal vaccine is given every five years and should be updated every five years, and then the men B vaccine should be given every two years. Um, in my patients, one of the things that I like to do is to check for titers, uh, so to make sure that people have responded effectively to my vaccine. And in some people, when I don't see a good enough response to vaccine, then I consider using prophylactic antibiotics. In the United Kingdom, uh, prophylactic penicillin is routinely used. Um, in this country, the IDSA guidelines, the, the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, do not support prophylactic penicillin use uh, for all patients, um, although I have, I have sometimes offered particularly for my patients who are younger or who are in circumstances where they might be more likely to be exposed to an infectious process. Uh, place people on prophylactic, anti uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Um, I think the other thing that I tend to do is to try to avoid complement activating risks for my patients. So I make sure that they know that if they get a virus or they get something that they should call and let us know so we can make sure that they are adequately, um, they have an adequate drug level of eculizumab. Um, for extravascular hemolysis, um, there really is no currently approved therapy. The novel drugs that are blocking C3 are expected to be an improvement over this and perhaps to block uh, the component of extravascular hemolysis that continues in many patients. Um, breakthrough hemolysis can occur with any complement activating condition. Um, and so, again, I tend to give my, my patients who have a complement activating condition, I tend to treat them early, so earlier than their two week time point. If they're having a scheduled surgical procedure or some kind of scheduled complement activating event, then I would tend to have them schedule that immediately after their drug dose. Um, if they get admitted for some other reason, then I tend to give them, again, their drug early. Um, what are the other things in this question? Um, I think I've addressed all of those. Okay, so. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from John. John is asking, how important is it to treat PNH if there is no history of clotting or other symptoms, but there is a relatively high clone percentage, such as greater than 60, and elevated LDH values, such as 900? Is wait and watch too risky to consider? This is a personal decision, right? The decision to begin a, a treatment um, has to be made in consultation with uh, one's doctor. Um, Certainly thrombosis has historically been a big risk and sometimes the thrombotic events can be a problem and they can be unexpected. I think that it's clear from the, the Korean registry data that 
the combination of an elevated LDH with symptoms is a bigger risk factor than just an elevated LDH. So in a person who truly has absolutely no symptoms, um, I think it would not be unreasonable to put off starting treatment. And I, it's also true that the past, to some extent, predicts the future. So people who have never had a clot, who are completely asymptomatic, um, you have to think twice before you consider starting a medication that you have to take every week initially and then every two weeks that's really going to change your life. So I, I, I have to, I, this is a personal decision to be made in consultation with one's doctor. I can't provide personal medical, but, but I think that, you know, everybody has to make that decision for themselves and take the risk versus benefit. Um, you can only use what's been published to predict. All right. Thank you. And I believe uh, John has a follow-up question. He is asking, how are anticoagulants used in PNH patients that already have very low platelet counts due to MDS, such as already below 20,000? Hmm. So most of those of us um, in the field would not anticoagulate someone who had a platelet count less than 50. Um, if you have a low, low platelet count like that, um, in, uh, the addition of an anticoagulant can substantially increase the risk of brain bleeding. And so um, in somebody who had um, myelodysplastic syndrome with very low platelets um, and who had a, a coexisting PNH clone, I might consider treatments related to management of the bone marrow failure syndrome. So um, everybody, again, I can't provide individual medical advice, but we know from the PNH registry that people with a PNH clone who, who simultaneously have um, who have bone marrow failure tend to survive less well. And eculizumab doesn't treat the bone marrow failure problem. Um, we have to focus on the bone marrow failure problem. So people who have very profound cytopenias, um, they should be treated for their bone marrow failure problem, I would say first. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Elena. Elena is asking, what happens with subjects of clinical trials after the end of the trial? Do they continue receiving the drug if they do not have access to it through their insurance or healthcare system? Uh, it depends on the clinical trial. Um, for, for drugs which are not yet FDA approved in general, if the patient is deemed to be receiving clinical benefit from the drug and there is no uh, other alternative treatment that is approved by the FDA, uh, most companies will continue to provide the drug. Um, once the drug becomes approved by the FDA, um, a majority of uh, companies would have people transition over to the FDA approved version of the drug. Um, and many of the many companies provide uh, support um, for access. Um, that's sort of an individualized thing. Um, does that does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Nicole. Nicole is asking: Is there an identified cause of PNH, such as a chemical or environmental exposure? No. No, we know that mistakes happen. Think, uh, when you think about the bone marrow, it's one of the most rapidly turning over tissues in your body. So your bone marrow has to replace all of your white cells every 10 days, all of your platelets every 7 to 10 days, all of your neutrophils every 6 to nine day, six to 10 days. The red cells get replaced every, hundred and, every three months. And so the bone marrow stem cells, even though they re divide relatively infrequently, um, maybe once a month to every three months, they're still dividing at a relatively higher rate than other types of cells in your body. And so um, as a result of that division, that relatively frequent division, it's possible for mistakes to be made. And so if a mistake gets made, because the, the pig A gene is actually on the X chromosome, and in adult tissues, um, in humans, if you're a man, you only have one copy of X, but, and if you're a woman, you, you lionize or you silence one copy of your X. So essentially all human genes on the X chromosome, um, there's only one effective copy in each cell. And so if you get a mistake in that one X, that, that one, one a gene on the X chromosome, 
it, it, it is usually a, an active or it, it's usually a it's usually um, not compensated for and so you get complete deficiency you can get complete deficiency of that product um, and that's what happens in people with PNH it's felt to be an acquired event we know that they can occur spontaneously in, in people even if who don't have aplastic anemia or people who don't have bone marrow failure but in the context of a bone marrow failure state like MDS or aplastic anemia we know that those cells have a survival benefit in the bone marrow space and so they tend to survive better and expand and so they can become a dominant population. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Myron. Um, Myron is from the Philippines, um, and for those, he's asking for those with no access um, to Solaris, what supportive treatments could be available? Yeah, so, so in places where eculizumab is not available, um, the standard approach is the same standard approach that has been that had had been used here in the United States. Um, effective anticoagulation for mitigation of the risk of blood clots, um, transfusion support, and for people who who have the ability who who have a bone marrow failure state, allogeneic bone marrow transplants, um, with all the caveats that come with that. All right, thank you. And I think that might be interrelated to this next question. Um, this next question comes uh, from uh, Elena, and she is asking, what are the treatment options for children with active hemolytic uh, PNH? So you're asking me a question that I'm afraid I'm not a pediatrician. Um, I know that pediatricians can be treated with eculizumab. Uh, pediatricians can be treated, pediatricians use eculizumab because I have gotten patients um, from my pediatric colleagues uh, who have graduated from their pediatric doctor to me. Um, I, I'm actually not fully, I'm not aware of the um, of the data in pediatric populations, but we certainly do use eculizumab in children. And, um, and I think in that context, generally the recommendation is to be a bit more aggressive with both vaccination as well as with prophylactic antibiotics, because of course children have a much higher rate of, uh, of infections all right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Yan Yin. Um, he, this person is asking, what kind of common pain relief and or antibiotics can be used for PNH patients? So um, antibiotics, um, one can use um, anti any kind of antibiotics in patients with PNH. There's no limitation. Uh, the preventive antibiotic that tends to be used it tends to be penicillin. In the United King Kingdom, here we often will use ciprofloxacin um, as well, but um, there is no specific antibiotic. In a patient who has PNH who's on eculizumab, if you have a fever, that's considered an emergency, and the recommendation is um, the recommendation is um, to start antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics, immediately or as quickly as possible. Uh, I often will give my patients a prescription for ciprofloxacin to take. If they develop a fever um, while they're waiting or until they get to the emergency room. Um, in terms of pain relief medications, um, again, uh, it's dependent on the bone marrow failure state. So if patients are neutropenic or thrombocytopenic, we tend to avoid Tylenol or things that can suppress a fever. Um, if you have a normal neutrophil count and a normal platelet count, then any kind of pain medication can be used. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Michael. Uh, Michael says he has noticed that most trials that he finds in clinicaltrials.gov use high LDG levels, or I think he might mean LDH levels, as a requirement for qualifying for trials. He has had normal or close to normal LDH levels since starting Solaris nine years ago, but has had frequent instances of breakthrough hemolysis. In short, he has had an inadequate response to Solaris, but his numbers, including his hemoglobin, are good. Is there any work being done to find better indicators of the severity of PNH symptoms? So, so I think his his complaint is one that I've heard before. Um, you know, I think some of the phase three clinical trials that are the switch trials did not require. So, the Alexion 1210 study did not require that the LDH be inadequately controlled on eculizumab. Um, likewise, the APL2 study, um, which is a switch study, doesn't require necessarily that a person be inadequately controlled on eculizumab. Um, 
for enrollment, as I recall. Um, I think that um, I think that one of the things that I tend to do with my patients is I tend to, to get them to diary their symptoms and then to, to, to check the LDH at the time of symptom breakthrough, also to check hemoglobin and to, to, to assess for um, other symptoms of disease, including belly pain and, and erectile dysfunction, which can be a bit more sensitive. Um, I actually have had a couple of my patients diary their erectile dysfunction symptoms relative to the dosing dates. And that's been very helpful. And so, if for some of those people, I've actually altered the dosing. And if you look in the in the invest in the um, package insert, and indeed, and if you read uh, if you read um, papers, uh, the recommendation is to to consider dose adjustment, either increasing the dose or changing the interval uh, for people who have substantial symptom breakthrough or in, in frequent uh, breakthrough hemolysis. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Susan. Susan would like you to discuss how ecolizumab can help prevent renal function issues and reverse or decrease renal function issues. Her GFR was 15 after a massive after massive hemolysis and long-term hemolysis. Uh, once on Solaris, the GFR gradually improved to normal range. So there are two mechanisms of kidney damage that happen with ecolizumab with with um, PNH. The first is that if you if you have an event, if you have a large population of cells that are the GPI anchor deficient, and you get some complement activating condition, such that your hemoglobin falls abruptly, that causes a massive intravascular hemolytic crisis, and all of a sudden the kidney has to see all that free hemoglobin. When that happens, that free hemoglobin scavenges nitric oxide inside the kidney. Remember, the kidney gets 20% of all the blood flow in the body. So when the nitric oxide gets scavenged, all of the arteries that are associated with the kidney spasm, and there can be an acute loss of kidney function as a result of essentially a, a vasospastic crisis in the kidney where the kidney gets damaged and inadequate blood flow from that vasospasm. That re the hemoglobin can be filtered through the kidney, which can also damage immediately the tubules. The, the kidney is actively trying to reabsorb the hemoglobin. Um, it gets reabsorbed into the kidney tubules, and, and actually the kidney tubules don't have a way of getting rid of iron. They don't have ferroportin, and so they can't, ex 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 they can't, they can't export the iron once they reabsorb it. And so that can cause sort of chronic low-grade uh, damage to the kidney, and in fact, renal hemosiderosis or kidney overload with iron. Um, once the eculizumab is given, in the very short term, what that does is it fixes the vasospasm at the kidney, and so that can slowly improve. That can improve things relatively quickly in terms of the vasospasm. And then the kidney is a remarkably adaptive organ, and so it can sometimes recover slowly over time. Um, the tubular cells that are overloaded with iron can actually be shed and can be replaced with more normal cells. And so over time, the amount of iron that's, that's, that's there can actually diminish. So we have seen patients um, who have acute renal failure from what we call ATN, acute tubular necrosis, from that immediate period of low blood flow to the kidney, and then that will slowly get better over time, and then you're no longer providing a whole bunch of iron to the kidney anymore, and so the kidney kind of slowly improves itself. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lewis. Uh, Lewis is a, uh, he's asking, is a patient's own banked cord blood useful if a PNH patient needs the bone marrow transplant? Wow, that's an interesting question. I I don't know the answer to that. Usually, a single cord is not adequate for a bone marrow transplant in an adult human, uh, just based on size, the number of cells. I'm not a transplant doctor. Um, I would imagine that if the transplant were, if there were enough cells in the cord blood unit, and if um, the person had received a conditioning regimen that included uh, that included cytoxin and um, ATG to get rid of the autoreactive T cell clones, that it might it might be possible to be used yeah I, I mean I I think it might I, I don't know the right I know I don't know that there is an answer I cannot answer that question but I think it's possible 
All right, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I wish I could answer that. I mean, it, it's an interesting <laughs> question. Of course. Uh, our next question comes from Myron. Myron actually has uh, two questions um, that I think um, are especially interest, an interesting question to answer now since we're in the middle of summer and everyone's traveling. He would like to know at uh, what hemoglobin level can a PNH patient travel via plane? And the next question is, can PNH patients be allowed to exercise? Uh, so I so with respect to the hemoglobin level, um, I actually don't make a, an absolute cutoff um, for any patient. I, I would say it depends a lot on how much uh, physical reserve the person has and how symptomatic they are. I think people who are symptomatic from anemia, short of breath and 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 tachycardic at uh, at sea level. Um, would likely be much more symptomatic and short of breath um, at altitude. And so if a person is completely asymptomatic um, and can exercise, for example, and has no symptoms, then that person is very unlikely to have substantial symptoms at altitude. Um, you know, usually a hemoglobin above 7 is adequate for travel in general. Um, I, I, but I guess I wouldn't. I wouldn't make an absolute cutoff. I would have. That's a kind of conversation that one has to have with their doctor and and based on their symptoms. All right. Thank you. And so I would uh, say the same is true for exercise. So I, I think um, the physical, the human body is a remarkably adaptive organism, and um, one shouldn't try to push beyond what's 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 comfortable or what's beyond what's. Um, but beyond what anybody can tolerate, but I think low-level exercise and moving up under the supervision of somebody, making sure that you're not pushing beyond your capacity, uh, exercise is always a good idea. All right, thank you. You have to be thoughtful about it. Absolutely. Uh, our next question comes from Jocelyn. Uh, Jocelyn has read about Solaris patients being at high risk for meningococcal infections. Is this rare or common, especially in those using over a long period of time? So um, meningococcal infection is a relatively rare complication. A meningococcus is a bacteria um, that is uh, that that causes a substantial bloodstream infection, can cause meningitis symptoms, but it can also be a bacteremia and can be devastating even in people who don't have uh, who don't have PNH and who are not on eculizumab. Um, the, the biggest thing, the biggest risk of developing a meningococcal infection is uh, some, developing something called disseminated intravascular coagulation, and people who have a deficient immune system are more likely to develop bigger complications from the infection. Um, eculizumab blocks the function of one of the body's um, protective processes for protection against this particular type of bacterial infection, but any kind of encapsulated bacterial infection and gonococcus likewise. Um, and so all patients who get started on eculizumab should be vaccinated against the meningococcus because there's a, there's a real concern. And there have been, in, uh, there have been patients who got meningococcal infection and, and some of them have done badly and have had substantial complications. So the recommendation is that any patient who gets a complement uh, blocking, blocking drug should receive a vaccination against meningococcus, and indeed should receive a vaccination also against serogroup group, group B meningococcus. And again, we mostly recommend that our patients get, um, get, get regular vaccines to protect them from infection. And I usually check titers to make sure that people have achieved antibody responses to those vaccines. And if they have not received antibi antibody reactions to those vaccines, then I consider treating with preventive antibiotics. And any patient who has a fever, who has any symptoms, should go immediately to the hospital and get started on antibiotics. All right. Thank you. I believe we have one last question. Uh, our next question comes from Elena. Uh, do, she would like to know, do PNH symptoms worsen with old age? Um, will treatment become less effective with time in an elderly patient? So 
there, there shouldn't be a substantial increase in, in efficacy over time unless somebody is starting to develop a lot of extravascular hemolysis, like we talked about before with C3 deposition and extravascular hemolysis. Um, so PNH symptoms um, in general wouldn't necessarily get worse unless somebody's general medical condition got worse. So if somebody had worse hemoglobin or became more debilitated or had other medical problems, obviously medical problems can interact with one another and so can can make things worse. Just but just the diagnosis of PNH with just with with just the with without other medical problems that should not get worse with age. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Griffiths, for your wonderful presentation and for your time. I would also just like to add that if you are still with us and you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P, at AMDS.org so that our patient educator can respond, or visit our online academy at AMDS.org forward slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.